Good morning, everyone. I hope that you guys are having a good start to your Friday. Um, we've got our exam on Monday morning. What I'm going to do in my plan for today is to finish up what we talked about on Wednesday with this last little bit of hemoglobin and myoglobin. And then I want to give you an overview of the exam. Um, I want to go through some of the learning objectives. And really what I'd like to do is give you some kind of guidance and direction on how to process those learning objectives, because I know that it's a lot, but there's a lot of material. So I'm both defending the, the volume, um, but also I, I'd like you to recognize that, you know, a lot of it you should feel comfortable with. You probably do feel comfortable with. So despite its volume, think like, okay, yeah, I'm good. I'm in good shape. I've got this. Um, and then what I'd like to do is kind of process those a little bit and maybe hit on um, what I would consider kind of like um, key considerations and like big ticket items and, you know, give you a little bit of a strategy and a thought process for your exam. Um, and so I'll answer questions about the exam after we kind of go through or whenever we start talking about the exam. But in the meantime, um, we are talking about hemoglobin and myoglobin. Now, these are two oxygen binding proteins that they have the same function, um, but with a little bit of a wrinkle to them. The important thing to understand about hemoglobin and myoglobin is that they are non-catalytic. So they will bind to oxygen, but they're not going to change oxygen at all. Now, one thing that will happen with both hemoglobin and myoglobin and hemoglobin to a greater extent is those proteins, those tertiary and quaternary structures of those proteins, they will change a little bit. So, you know, this is my motion for protein changing structure. Now, I think that it's always helpful to, like when it comes to learning about hemoglobin and myoglobin, um, there's almost a like, trivia type of mindset with it. Like, what are the details of it? What are those those trivial facts that I want or need to know? And one of them that is that heme is the prosthetic group. Heme gives he both hemoglobin and myoglobin the ability to bind to oxygen with a high affinity. Okay, now that's like a, a almost like trivial anecdotal knowledge, like, ah, I gotcha, I got that question at bar trivia, but to you know, pull back a layer a little bit, you have to remember that this is a protein and proteins are made up of amino acids. So what is the amino acid that's important with respect to coordinating and binding to oxygen? And the amino acid that's involved in that is none other than this ringed molecule right here known as histidine. Now, histidine is actually found in two different places coordinating oxygen within that or adjacent to that heme ring. So here is our mm -hmm. ring, our ring structure. Did somebody have a question? I, I just heard it. I'm not sure if that was intentional. Okay, I'm going to switch to mute everyone upon entry. Um, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself, but for the time being. Um, until then. So here's our heme ring, and at the center of it is our divalent iron cation. And then above that is an oxygen, an O2 molecule. Below the heme and below that iron is our histidine ring. Now, that histidine, one of the things that I want you to recognize about it is that this depiction of it, well, it doesn't have a charge. It's uncharged because histidine is or sorry, it is uncharged. Now that's kind of interesting because histidine classified, or sorry, is classified as a polar positive residue. Now I know that I, I mentioned that you do not have to memorize your pKa values, your N termini, C termini, or your R group pKa values. But I'd like to highlight histidine because histidine's R group has a pKa of about 6.1. And so what that means is that at a pH of 7, that pH actually favors the deprotonated form of histidine. 
which is actually what we see here. Let me erase my red circle there, but that's actually what we see with this, this form of histidine below. Now, what that means is that this has lone pair of electrons. That lone pair of electrons make it a great, uh, a great candidate to share electrons with this um, iron in the center of this heme ring. Now, the significance of that is, I'm going to skip over a slide and come back because we've got a, a question, but I'm going to come back to that. Here is a, another depiction, let me clear all my drawings, of the heme ring from a kind of side angle view of it. So, if you look at this, here is our... So we've got a side angle view of histidine, or I'm sorry, of that heme ring. Here's our histidine ring. <clears throat> this is our alpha carbon. Just a second, I'm sorry. So histidine stabilizes both iron and oxygen. That's a great question. So um, histidine is stabilizing the, okay, let's take the Iron, its positioning is stabilized by the heme ring. That iron that's in the heme ring is able to kind of take on the oxygen. Now, with respect to the histidine residues, there's one that's below the iron ion, which is this one right here, and then there's one that's above it. Now, the significance of these two residues is that what we see is this right here, where I'm drawing a, a star. I'm going to erase my other stars. This is what you could consider the starting point. And what I want to do is give you kind of a, let's see, I have my different tools. Draw a line, okay. I'm going to draw a line, a straight line here. What this is showing is the that red or that straight red line that I drew is showing the peptide backbone, the polypeptide backbone of hemoglobin or myoglobin. Doesn't really matter. This is the starting point. So then this star is the starting point of the iron ion where we've already got this nice sharing of electrons between this iron ion and our histidine ring, that that histidine has that lone pair of electrons because it's not protonated. Now, what happens is this is basically the starting point of our histidine, our polypeptide backbone, and that iron ion. When oxygen, however, binds, would anyone care to tell me what happens to the uh, polypeptide backbone and compare it to that straight line that I just drew. And, you know, I'll give you a little bit of a lead. Does it stay in the same place to make it a, a binary question? And if it doesn't, then what happens to it? What happens to that polypeptide backbone? It moves towards the more electronegative elements. Of the Essentially, what's happening is that oxygen binds and kind of pulls that histidine ring and pulls that polypeptide backbone. This is essentially a what leads to a conformational change of the protein. So when oxygen binds... Another way to summarize this is when oxygen binds, then the heme is pulled up. So I always, and then I'll, when the heme is pulled up, then the his residue the one that is below it is pulled up, 
which leads to the PP or polypeptide backbone being pulled up. So the way that I always try to imagine this is I've got my the tips of my fingers here. The tips of my fingers meeting, that's where my iron ion is. When oxygen binds, then they kind of flatten out. And everything that's attached to the tips of my fingers, which I'm going to construct something real quick. I have a zip tie and the packet or the, the little sleeve that my uh, stylus goes in. Okay, so here is before oxygen binds, and that's after oxygen binds. Now, the thing is that these are very minor changes, but this gives a, a good starting point for understanding protein conformational changes, very, very minor changes. And here, what we have is this iron ion goes up 0.4 angstroms. So if you think about, you know, measurements being in the, the range of angstroms, this is less than one angstrom of a change that is caused by oxygen binding. But there's a ripple effect because everything that's attached to that iron ion is going to move as well. It, I always kind of think about protein conformational changes almost like, um, uh, like facial reconstructive surgery. I remember watching this show years ago that was like a cosmetic surgeon. And they said that, you know, basically anytime they did any sort of procedure, they would never make any sort of movement less than, you know, two millimeters or something like that. But it's these very, very minor moves that cause very dramatic changes in the positioning of different atoms. Okay, is heme characteristic of a oxyhemoglobin? Along with that, I thought there were two histidine amino acids that make up a heme protein. So is heme characteristic of a hemoglobin, of oxyhemoglobin? Um, heme is present in both oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. It's also present in myoglobin. Now, heme, for your second question, there are two histidine residues within hemoglobin. Heme is not a protein. Heme is a prosthetic group associated with a protein. Now, if you'd like to, I mean, you can unmute yourself and clarify your questions. I don't know if I answered them, though. Or you can. Oh, hi. Hi. Did you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, sorry. so yeah, I don't know. Like, I was under an impression that, um, well, you, you described that um, that team is not a person. But right? um, let me see. That I, I, I don't know. I just remember that you said that there was histine on you know, the bottom part and there was histine on the top. You know, which was, yeah. So, I was kind of a little bit, a little bit confused about that because now you're saying, or now that, you know, it's known that there's. Rather, there's going to be like an oxygen, which you know is, is going to be you know taken from the the lungs, if I'm not mistaken. You know, and then it, that's going to be so transferred because you know how you showed that pathway. Is that is that what you're describing right now? That pathway. I I I couldn't hear you that well. It was a little bit echoey on my end. Um, there are two histidine residues, and if we look at what we're looking at primarily, let's reference back to this slide. This shows both of the histidine residues. So I'm going to clear all my drawings out of this one. We have a what's known as a proximal and a distal histidine. I'll just refer to them as upper and lower. Now, this is when we talk about oxygen binding, so when we go back to the other slide, what I'm referencing here is just the lower histidine residue. So the upper one doesn't, um, is not going to cause the dramatic changes or it's not going to have a dramatic change from this oxygen binding. It's more of like, it serves as a uh, upper limit as to what molecules could fit in there 
So, um, okay. I, if, if I didn't answer your question, please don't, uh, please don't just be like, okay, he's done with me. No, I let me know. I, I but I will proceed if, uh, if the come if the question comes back though, please don't hesitate. Okay, so the significance of all of this though, it's not just oh wow these you know point four angstrom movements cause lots of things to change ripple effect ooh cool great philosophy question. The way that this is illustrated best is with these proteins. So what we see here now is the porphyrin ring. Okay, so. What's depicted in blue is an alpha helix with the lower histidine residue. Okay, so it's it's kind of tough to see, but if you look at this blue dashed line right here and here, that is our histidine ring that's a part of this alpha helix. Now, what's depicted in pink here is our alpha helix. Again, with the lower histidine residue, but this is after O2 binding. So we've got, um, in blue, it is before O2 binding. So this would be considered your deoxy form, whereas the pink one is your oxygenated form. Now, what that leads to is this alpha helix has gone from this orientation to kind of this orientation. It causes these shifts on the small level. Now, I bring this up because this is where we have what's known as a T to R transition. There are two states of proteins, and this is common of both catalytic and non-catalytic proteins. I want to introduce this term for you, allosteric. How about write a letter A, Joel? Come on. Allosteric. So allosteric means different shapes. So there are allosteric proteins that have effectively two different shapes. And we, we regularly refer to these as a T state. T state and an R state. Now, the T state of an allosteric protein is the inactive. Whereas the R state is your active form. Now, the significance of this is that there's lots of different proteins that are allosteric proteins. And effectively what they have is, or this is significant for how they behave. Um, now, O2 binding is going to cause these conformational changes. Now, on a grand scale, what this is going to look like, what these minor changes are going to look like is, let's look at our T state of our protein. Okay, so this is an example of hemoglobin as a T state protein, or, or sorry, in its T state form, in its deoxyhemoglobin form. If you look in the background in the upper left-hand corner, that's our alpha-2 subunit. In the foreground, in the upper right-hand corner, we've got our beta-1 subunit. In the background, in the lower right-hand corner, alpha-1. Lower left-hand corner, in the foreground, is our beta-2. So we have these, these four proteins, or these four subunits, that make up a uh, quaternary structure of a protein. Now, what I want you to notice about this, and we're going to toggle back and forth between this model of the protein and our, our R state. I want you to draw your attention to this central cavity. So this central cavity right here is approximately that large. And, you know, just for, let's say that it's, for the sake of uh, scaling, let's call it 1.0 angstroms. 
The actual measurement's a little bit different, but for the, the sake of understanding the concept of this, that's what we're looking at. Now, in its T state, it has that central cavity that's one angstrom. In its R state, what happens to that cavity? And this is one of the good things about being able to toggle back and forth and keeping my annotations. What happened to that central cavity? It shrank, that's great. Now, the significance of that is there are compounds that can fit into that central cavity. And when they fit into that central cavity in the T state, what do you think they do about hemoglobin's ability to bind oxygen? Do you think that it's enhanced? Do you think that it changes? Or what do you think? Absolutely. It is negatively impacted. So if you can effectively lock your protein in the T state, well, then it's going to be stuck in, the, at, in that inactive form. Now, there's a compound that we'll talk about um, next week. It's known as it's um, bisphosphoglycerate. What bisphosphoglycerate does is it basically prevents the transition from the T state to the R state. And that might sound like, well, that's not good because I want hemoglobin to be able to bind oxygen. But in some circumstances, it's actually a good physiological response. We'll get, like I said, we'll get into that later. But this T state versus this R state, the central cavity changes. But then if you look at lots of these different subunits, they have repositioned. If you look at one that I always like to reference whenever I'm looking at these structures is look at this heme. And I'm going to draw the boundaries of it. I'm going to draw a big block where that heme is. There we go. That's our heme ring with our iron in the deoxygenated form. When you go to the oxygenated form, oh, it's shifted downward. That 0.4 angstrom movement that that iron ion went underwent, well, that caused lots of other parts of this protein to undergo changes. Transitioning to our R state of our, or our oxygenated form of our protein. So I wanted to introduce to you um, allosteria as a phenomenon, as a, because it's related to protein structure and it's related to protein function. Allosteria is where a protein has two different states and two different shapes. It's, um, it's active state, it's R state, and it's active shape, it's R shape, and it's inactive or T state or inactive uh, state and shape of it there. Now, in terms of why that's happening, well, that's where that, that small little incision, that O2 binding that causes that iron ion to shift just a small amount. And of course, we're zoomed in on this figure right here. But if you look at that iron ion, I mean, it's moving, it's moving only 0.4 angstroms. That 0.4 angstrom causes this to become this and gives us our protein that's fully functional. Okay, now what I wanted to do is give us a question. There we go. Is the amino acid that positions the iron at the center of the heme ring ionizable? I'm feeling like everyone got this right. Not quite. Yes, 
Histidine is an ionizable amino acid. Histidine can be deprotonated, which is what we see here. Histidine, whenever it is bound to or coordinating that heat, that iron and that oxygen, well, that histidine is deprotonated. Now, with that in mind, add to the chat if you think that the ionization state of histidine is significant for binding of oxygen or hemoglobin's ability to bind oxygen. This is just a yes or no. Yeah, 100%. It is absolutely significant for binding ability of hemoglobin to um, to oxygen. And that's something that we're going to get into next time. Now, with all of that said, one of the things that I want to stress, that I want to mention, is although hemoglobin is an allosteric protein, myoglobin is not. And one of the reasons... Come in is that hemoglobin has four subunits and myoglobin has one subunit. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and switch over to review mode. But before I do that, does anyone have any questions about hemoglobin and myoglobin? So, when carbon dioxide binds, well, carbon dioxide, actually, its greatest affinity is to bind to the end termini of the protein in an event known as a carbamation. Um, so, actually, I, I think that if you're referencing my note on the bottom, what happens when carbon monoxide binds? Well, the interesting thing about carbon monoxide is that the this kind of takes you back to Gen Chem 1, but um, the structure of carbon monoxide is very similar to O2 because they're both linear molecules. Now, since they're both linear molecules, they both fit into the same place. Now, the significance of that is in carbon monoxide, since it's capable, let me... Since it fits in there, C terminal is way less reaction. Um, not not quite. So, what happens when C? I feel like I'm getting okay. Okay, when carbon dioxide binds, it's something known as a carbamation. And so basically carbon dioxide reacts with the end termini of the protein, and that's how carbon dioxide can be expelled from the body is through this carbamation. That's something that I'm going to get into in the next uh, bit. Now, carbon monoxide, what carbon monoxide can do is that it basically jumps in here, but rather than it being angled like uh, O2, it instead fits like that. And when you think about... Um, carbon dioxide, or sorry, carbon monoxide versus O2, because of carbon monoxide's ability to bind like straight up like this, that's why carbon monoxide is so lethal is because it is, it has a uh, higher binding affinity for this iron in the center of your heme ring than O2 does. So that's why a very small amount of carbon monoxide can be fatal because basically your hemoglobin is like, oh, well, I have a greater affinity for that than I have for O2, which is seemingly what I would otherwise want. Okay, then. So exam two review. Let me close that. And that. Okay. Um, I gave you guys the uh, learning objectives. And if you're asking like, okay, so... I'll give you, first of all, the overview of the exam. And overview. 
It's going to be 33 questions. 11 questions are classified as old stuff. Twenty two questions are new stuff. <laughs> now, the old stuff, I think a very fair question is how should I study for that? Go to exam number one. Take the questions from exam number one and ask yourself how can I change this to make this a different question? And I don't mean that in a smart, ass, smart aleck way of, well, I can delete every letter and, and change it that way. I instead mean, if this question gives you a structure for a sugar and says, what is this with respect to glucose? You know, I want you to know the structure of glucose. I stress that. So I could give you the C2 epimer of glucose. I could give you a structure of that and then say, how does this sugar relate to glucose? And your answer would be, well, it is the C2 epimer of glucose. Alternatively, if I asked you for the structure of, you know, if I gave you a structure of glucose, you know, maybe my question would be something like, this is an example of a select all that are true. It's an aldose. It's a hexose. And then if it's cyclic, what else is it? Um, so I would use exam number one and, you know, work with your peers and or, or yourself and just kind of rewrite questions. How would I do this question a little bit differently to make it a unique question, but asking over the same kind of same topic, the same parameters. So that's how I would advise studying the old stuff. Now, the new stuff. So the new stuff has to do with a couple of different topics. The new stuff is water, amino acids, proteins, and then hemoglobin and myoglobin. <clears throat> so that's four major topics. And it's not a complete even distribution. Um, if I were to classify it, if I were to divide this up, I would say eight questions over amino acids. That gives me 14 more. So then I'd say probably four. That's 12. So then I have 10 more. Um, six. That's, that's 12, 18, and four of these. So that's where I would land with respect to, like, how do I split this information up? Um, so then let's go after water. Sorry, I closed the chat and then somebody asked something. Yes, you do get a note card. And I'm going to open the exam at 8.30. And I'm going to close it at um, 1 p.m. If you need it earlier than 8.30 in the morning, then that's good. Um, okay, so then I saw a question. Could the C2 epimer of glucose also be listed as mannose, or would it just be listed as this? Is this either one of those um, are, are, are good options. How will we submit an image of a note card? I'm going to post a assignment, an ungraded assignment, just submit a, a scanned images or you know, photos of your uh of your note card. That will be ungraded and I'll put that up. That will go do that after your exam. <clears throat> yes, you can have a blank sheet of paper. Okay, so water will be Henderson Hasselbach equation. This uh this word always throws me for a loop, but it's Henderson Hustle Balk, not Bach. I've said Henderson Hustle Bach for like 15 years and then I read it. Um the Henderson Hustle Balk equation, 
EQN. Um, then there will be titration curves. Interpreting a titration curve. Um, which titration curve of the images that are shown below corresponds to a diprotic, a triprotic, a monoprotic acid. Um, those are two of the biggest items. Let me look back at the learning objectives for anything else. Um, yeah, types of types of interactions. types of int and strength of them. Strength, TH, not HT. Um, and then, yeah, those are, are three of the big ticket items. For amino acids, I want you to know structures. You gotta be able to identify them. Classifications, I'll say classes. Then structure, I'll add a little bit more to this. Structure at a given pH. So if I provide you with a pH and say, um, the pH of this solution is 7.4, which of the amino acids shown below is the prominent form at that pH. In order to do that sort of question, I'm also providing you with pKa values. So you'll have those so that you can do those sorts of calculations and do those sorts of interpretations. Yes, I will give you the pKa's. Then I will also give you guys um, a pI calculation. I want you to be able to calculate a pI of a monoprotic, a diprotic, the PI of a peptide. How would you do that when you have a tripeptide or a dipeptide? I think that on my YouTube channel, I've got some videos where I walk through that um, so I can post those. Hello, sir, would I be able to speak with you after class? I have one question about the myoglobin, hemoglobin. I've got a class right after this, but potentially after that. Um, so around, what would that be, 1050, email me, and then I'll send you the Zoom link. Cool. Um, then let's see, PI of a peptide, um, charges of a peptide. And this right here, and these right here, these really deal with the predominant form. So the most common form. So if I showed you a molecule and said what, or and sorry, um, what is the possible charger? What is the likely charge of this molecule at this pH? I'm asking about what's the most likely charge there. Um, then in addition to this with respect to amino acids, which if I gave you one question over each of those topics, that's six questions. So that's that's a, a a bit of material there um and that's not even getting into single letter codes and three letter codes and that's single letter codes for amino acids and then interpreting a peptide with a single or three letter code um now, with respect to kind of all of these things, if I were to ask you to calculate the PI of a peptide, I'm going to give you two different options, number one or two, and I want everyone to input their, their thoughts on our, our, our chat. If I gave you the peptide A, L, M, uh, let's see, W, then G, or R, D, K, A, C, and 
E. Which of these peptides is more interesting for me to ask you to calculate the PI or the charge of? And I'll give you a spoiler. One of them is more interesting than the other. And, you know, I'm, I'm going full disclosure, like there is a, there is an interface where interesting and challenging are in the forefront. So one of these is a little bit more challenging. Two, absolutely. I don't want you to be thinking of that as like, oh, he's only going to ask us the hard questions. That's not my intention. My intention is to ask more engaging and interesting questions. And it's really damned boring to ask a question about every single one of these amino acids right here. They're all diprotic. And when they're in a peptide, not a single one of them has an ionizable group. So to calculate the PI, all that you need is the pKa of this group and the pKa or of the N-termini and the C-termini. That's kind of a boring thing to do. So if you're like, I need to be able to calculate this, play around with a peptide like this, as opposed to something like this. Now, with that in mind, when it comes to asking about structures and classes, chances are I'm more likely to ask you a question about an ionizable amino acid, a polar positive or polar negative. Why? Because, well, they're going to be involved in ionic interactions. Okay, so... Um, now, moving on so I can get through all the, everything that I wanted to say. Um, proteins, we've got levels of organization. Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure. What's the difference between those? What are the forces that stabilize them? Make sure that you know what those forces are and so that you can kind of come back with that. Then... We talked about secondary structure. We talked about alpha helices and beta sheets. For one of those, our alpha helices, we talked about a calculation. We talked about like dimensions. For instance, one rotation is approximately 3.6 angstroms. Okay. One rotation of an alpha helix is about 3.6 angstroms. Or sorry, ugh, not angstroms, 3.6 amino acids. 3.6 amino acids. That one rotation has a height of 5.4 angstroms. The average um, alpha helix is going to be about 10 amino acids. All of these questions, or all of this information right here will be useful if I were to ask a question like, an alpha helix that has 10 rotations, how many amino acids are required for an alpha helix with 10 rotations? Or what's the minimum number? What's the average number? And your answer would be about 36, because if each rotation is 3.6 amino acids, then we're talking about 10 times 36. Now, how tall is that? Well, if it's got 10 rotations, each rotation is approximately 5.4 angstroms, it's 54 angstroms. So those, those sorts of calculations. Whenever we get to tertiary structure and quaternary structure, it's important to know types of interactions, which takes us back to this right here, types of interactions and different strengths, but it puts it in the context of amino acids. So sure, you might have a lot of uh, histidine amino acids and aspartic acid. So it's a polar, polar positive and polar negative residues. Those are going to interact with one another to stabilize the tertiary structure in an ionic interaction. How would a bunch of leucines and valines and isoleucines interact? Well, they would be stabilized by, or they would be kind of inducing the hydrophobic effect. Then for myoglobin and hemoglobin, what I'm looking for there is, just draw a line right here, myoglobin and hemoglobin, I'm looking for, well, what did, what's the difference between these two proteins? We introduced a new concept today, allostery, 
what is allosteria? What are the two states? What's T versus R? Which one's your active form? And which one's your inactive form? I'm looking back at my learning objectives to make sure that... Um, okay. Where do they function? That's on... Okay, yeah. Where, where do hemoglobin and myoglobin function? What are... What do they do? What's the name of the structural motif? That's that... Um, globin fold. Uh, what's a prosthetic group? What's the prosthetic group that they use? That's heme, which amino acid helps the prosthetic group stabilize the oxygen molecule? That's histidine. What are the implications of the oxidation state of iron within the heme ring? We didn't really talk about that, so I wouldn't expect anything like that. Um, but to answer that question, it's got to be Fe2+, plus. Fe3+, plus has, it's a smaller ion, so it's not going to fit as well. Um, what are the T state and the R state? Those are the two different states of allosteric proteins. What is the structural difference between those R and T states? That central cavity shrinks down a lot in the T state, or sorry, in the R state. Um, and it's a considerably larger central cavity in the uh, T state, in the deoxygenated form. Okay, so that, I, I'm sorry for taking all the time, but if anyone has any questions, um, I'd love to entertain any questions that you may have. I'd love to answer them, not entertain them. Try to sound fancy. And I'll, I'll go back so that everyone can see this. Could you summarize what are on the two quizzes? There's just questions about um, protein structures. You have two attempts at them. They're just like those uh, question, or they're, they're just homework quiz questions. They're just, they're open note, do whatever you want on this. Um, does the test close at 1 or 11? It closes at 1 p.m. Any other questions? Hemoglobin and myoglobin. Um, where do these two different globular proteins function? Um, in the lungs and in the tissue. Hemoglobin through the lungs and through your circulatory system, whereas myoglobin is, is in the muscle tissue. Um, Why is tyrosine polar if the R group is mostly carbon, but amino acids like methionine and tryptophan are not polar? The reason for that is tyrosine's hydroxyl group is kind of protruding outward, whereas methionine, for example, and tryptophan both have their uh, more electronegative elements, the, the sulfur and the nitrogen kind of packed within those rings or packed within the ring or kind of blocked in some respects by a methyl group. Sure. All right, well, um, it's 949. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to contact me through email. Um, other than that, I, I hope you have a great weekend. Quiz three allows two attempts, but quiz two, I will fix that, Vince. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. It's that right now. There's two. Two attempts. Save. 